So, yeah, I'm Ed Parferis. I'm Conservation Manager at Dead Wildlife Trust. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about Two Moors Pine Moors Martin project in a bit. Um, and this is a partnership project between ourselves at Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, the National Trust, the Woodland Trust, and Dartmoor and Exmoor National Parks. Um, and, and we've been working together on this uh, closely over a number of years now. So first things first, let's have a look at a, at a pine martin. This is uh, a pine martin. They're part of the mustelid family. Uh, so related to things like weasels, stoats, polecats, otters, um, and they're, they're a native mammal. They've been present in Britain since the last ice age, about 10,000 years ago. Uh, and probably about 7,000 years ago, they, they would have um, had their peak um, population when we had our peak woodland coverage in, in, in Britain. And at that point, they would have been Britain's second uh, commonest carnivore behind weasels. And we would have had a population of about 150,000 or so across, uh, across Britain. Uh, just to give it some context there, there would have only been about 2,500 people in Britain at that time. And, and a lot of the decline, uh, the issues that have caused the decline about, of uh, pine martins has been the decline in woodland coverage uh, across uh, the UK. Now, uh, I say about 7,000 years ago, we would have, would have had our peak woodland coverage. And, and uh, a chap called Oliver Rackham, who's sort of esteemed uh, woodland uh, ecologist uh, uh, estimates that we would have lost about half of that woodland coverage by about two and a half thousand years ago. And by doomsday in England, we, we were down to just 15 percent coverage across the country. But in Devon, we've had a longer history of, of low woodland cover. And we are actually on this graph on the right here down to just 3.8 percent, just below 4 percent. And in Cornwall, that was that was lower. It's about 3 percent woodland coverage. Um, and across the West Country, we, we had low rates as well, in Somerset slightly higher, Dorset slightly higher. But this uh, only accounts for large woodlands, and of course the West Country is renowned for this sort of landscape, this landscape of big hedges, small field systems, woodlands uh, in, in small farm copses tucked around all over the countryside. And that network uh, of ancient uh, countryside, um, uh, really enabled species to, to linger in this landscape for much longer than just the, um, the woodland cover suggests. So pine martins did survive into uh, beyond doomsday and um, beyond doomsday in the uh, it, it, once we got into sort of later medieval periods then we we started to see more direct per, um, attention paid to um, to pine martins and, and rather than just the habitat loss that had been happening over, over millennia. And in the 1530s, the 1560s, Tudor laws came in around the preservation of grain um, and they were known as the vermin laws and, and, uh, and they, it came at a time when people were really struggling with food, there'd been a series of failed harvest over, over a couple of centuries um, and people were really concerned about loss of food and any threats to it. Now the first uh, law in 1832, uh, 1532 um, was about uh, removing things like corvid, so jays, rooks, crows, those sort of things. But a later law that came in in 1566 by uh, Elizabeth I includes a huge range of species, including pine martins. And, and really any species that wasn't seen as, as, uh, as potentially useful to people, uh, and especially if it was seen as a threat to the production of food or, or, or people's lifestyles, uh, was seen as uh, needed to be removed from the landscape. And parishes paid bounties um, to, uh, to remove animals for, for those who brought uh, evidence that they killed these animals. And, and if, if parishes didn't remove enough, they were actually fined by, um, uh, by, by the king and government as well. Um, now, not all parishes uh, carried this out, but uh, they were they were widely carried out, the, these uh, vermin, um, uh, uh, vermin laws and, and the works going on behind them. So, so, and that had disastrous consequences for animals already on the brink from a long period of, of woodland decline, habitat decline. And they were only repealed these laws in the late 19th century. And so people were still carrying this out. Uh, alongside this, we had a long-standing uh, interest in pine martin fur. So they'd always been prized for fur um, and their pelts were prized by, in medieval times, by uh, royals and aristocrats and the likes. And industries were built up around their trade. Obviously, as their uh, pine martin numbers started to diminish, so did the trade. 
and things like the import of foreign furs also uh, had an effect on that. But, but pine marten fur continue to be sought after until really relatively recently uh, with fur farms replacing sort of wild hunting and the likes. So pine martens are under pressure in terms of habitat loss and uh, direct pressure from um, being hunted. Um, but they still persisted in the southwest, albeit in low numbers, probably due to that landscape of, of large hedges, small fields and the likes. Um, and evidence um, from the parish records that, uh, that were uh, capturing uh, uh, the reports of those parish vermin killings um, demonstrate that, that pine martens did survive in, in our landscape. And, and these were the numbers that, that were reported in uh, Roger Lovegrove's book, Silent Fields, over between about the, the 1550s and the 1890s. Very low numbers, but they persisted throughout that period. And of course, just as appetite was waning for uh, uh, vermin laws and for pine martin fur, the rise of sporting estates in the 18th and 19th centuries placed further direct pressures on pine martins. Um, the larger landowners in, invariably owned the largest tracts of woodland that still provided refuge for pine martens, and these same landowners were now developing new enterprises, shooting enterprises that couldn't tolerate predators. And, and so pine martens alongside uh, uh, various other predatory animals and birds um, were targeted and largely eradicated. So it's sort of the, the uh, cherry on the, on the top of the cake, really, in terms of uh, uh, doing for pine martens. And, and, so in looking at the history of pine martins of Britain, we see this loss of habitat, these direct pressures, and this resulted on uh, this picture here, which is um, showing where pine martins were around the 1850s, uh, that they were still present in large parts of the country, but very rare. And really by the turn of the 20th century and early 20th century, pine martins have been lost from nearly all of the UK, most of England and Wales, just a couple of isolated pockets in Snowdonia and Cumbria. And uh, Northwest Scotland being a main stronghold for, for them. In, in the Southwest, we lost them in the 1880s or thereabouts. The last record I've seen is uh, about 1880 in Paynton, um, uh, not somewhere I'd uh, immediately think of as Pine Martin territory, but there you go. Um, now we still have, have seen Pine Martin records pop up um, since the 1880s. Uh, and that's, that's for a few reasons. Likely escapes from fur, fur farms were part of that, but also other private collections and the likes. And of course, there is a small possibility that, that individual isolated populations could survive, although that's, it is unlikely, but it, it is possible. From um, after the First World War and the, the changes in, in land use, the numbers of people out working on the land and, and the numbers of gamekeepers and the likes, then uh, in uh, following this time, the, the, the Scottish population did start to naturally recover. Um, but I think the, the populations in England and Wales were so uh, small by that point that they weren't able to recover. And that takes us to where we are now, really. So the uh, expansion in, in Scotland con has continued and they've now expanded across most of Scotland, obviously a bit around the central belt. Uh, where it's probably not quite so suitable for them, but they're now into the Scottish borders uh, and expanding into Northumberland and Cumbria. Some small translocations have happened there, but it's, it's largely uh, natural recolonisation. We've had uh, reintroductions into uh, Wales and into the Forest of Dean. We'll hear more about that later. But the, uh, the, the English population has, uh, uh, has remained really just in the form of a, of a number of small isolated populations. Uh, we, we know of ones in Shropshire and Hampshire and, and various other ones that we hear about every now and again, but their, their origins are known and, and critically their, their, their numbers have stayed very, very small even after this, this sort of expansion. We, the estimate in 2018 was about 3,700 um, animals in the UK, but we, and we're probably up around the 4,000 mark now, but, but they're critically endangered in England and Wales. Um, they're, they're just not present in most of our countryside. And because of that, they're protected in law. Okay, let's have a look at another video. So here's our Pine Martin. It's, it's absolutely tree dependent. It's, it's really reliant on, on extensive areas of woodland. Um, and, and it's sort of arboreal, it's an excellent climber. And, and a lot of this is, is about both um, it being able to seek its prey, but also being able to avoid being predated itself. Uh, it has predators in the form of foxes and birds of prey. So in places like Scotland, you might expect golden eagle or goshawk or the like to, to take, especially kids, 
Um, it's um, found in both broadleaf and coniferous woodland, uh, and it will occupy other habitats as well, so non-woodland habitats, so things like scrub, hedgerows, uh, rocky and craggy habitats, and also the open habitats like grasslands either side of woodlands, and that can extend up to a couple of hundred metres, so males up to a couple of hundred metres, females up to a hundred metres or so from woodlands, so a range of habitats, but it is reliant on this woodland, and particularly when you think, look at denning, it's denning in tree cavities, in squirrel drays, bird nests, uprooted trees, the root plates of those, and only if it can't find habitat for denning uh, in those places will it look for things like buildings or whatever. Home range does vary quite a lot, dependent on habitat and food, and, and normally that's about, uh, for an individual primate, normally about a five to 10 square kilometer um, uh, home range. Okay, so just looking at pine martin ecology uh, a bit here. Uh, pine martins are, are omnivores, they're, they're opportunists and, and they're looking for abundance uh, of, of food. Uh, they're seasonal, but they, they have staple diets as well. So in this country, small mammals are critical. They're, they're the year round staple part of the diet, particularly field voles, but other small mammals too, whether it's voles, mice and squirrels. We'll come on and talk about squirrels in a bit. At this time of year, they're, they're also supplementing that with fruit and fruit play an important part of their, their diets in summer and autumn. Uh, in other parts of Europe, fruit plays a much more important role, uh, I guess more abundant in some other parts around the Mediterranean, it could be up to about 70% uh, of their diet year round. So that whole thing of sort of what's available, what, where the opportunity is, um, is, is really important for this sort of predator and, and omnivore. At other times of year, the, the, the diet will vary. So, so um, in spring and summer, then birds can play a part of their, their diet as well. So they'll, they'll focus on common and abundant species. So those that are the, 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 the easiest to catch, the largest, the, the, the slowest, the noisiest, those sorts of things. So, so pigeons and corvids like jays, rooks and crows, those sorts of things. Blackbirds would also appear in there. And there they'll raid eggs from nests, They'll um, take uh, juveniles from, from nests and they'll, they'll also take adults as well. Um, in the summer months, they will take invertebrates, uh, so insects and the likes, generally focusing on larger, larger insects, but also those, uh, so things like large beetles, uh, butterflies, moths, those sorts of things, but also those social insects where there's, there's you know, good energy um, uh, value in going to, to, to find them, getting in and taking bees and wasps and those sorts of things. And then, uh, another part of their diet is carrion. So the, the pine martins are, are scavengers as well as predators, and that they'll they'll scavenge carrion year round. But particularly in winter, that plays a much more important part. While these other food sources are less available, and they'll take sheep or deer or anything that's available in that time. And I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later on. Okay, I'm just going to switch that off. Can't get this to play. There we go. Okay, so pine martins are largely nocturnal. They're crepuscular, which means they're active at dawn and dusk. Uh, and they're solitary most of the year, apart from when they're breeding. They're not out in, in packs or anything. And uh, when they're breeding means they're mating in, in July or August. Um, and they'll normally have about one to three kits, something of that sort, the following March or April after a process called delayed in, uh, implantation, which a lot of mammals have uh, to take advantage of the best food sources available for their young. They're quite slow breeders, so they only start breeding when they're two to three years old. They only live until they're about 12 and only typically have one, but maybe up to three or even very rarely up to five kids. So their, their, their ability to um, uh, expand their population is quite limited. They're very slow in that process. OK, um, so just sort of tackle some of the myths that are out there around them. Um, so first things first, pine martins aren't going to be sort of running rampage across uh, the countryside. So even where uh, habitat for pine martins is excellent and, and ideal for pine martins, you get an, an average density, the number of pine martins across an area will be about half a pine martin a square kilometre. Um, and that figures, if you, if you think back to the, the uh, Pine Martins home range, that's um, uh, five to 10 square kilometres and, and males and females may overlap a little bit. 
So, and that's in good habitat. And in the West Country, uh, we, we've got some good habitat, but, but some less good habitat. So we're gonna see a, a range, but it's unlikely to get up to this sort of level across the whole of the West Country. In terms of size, uh, pine martins weigh about a kilo, kilo and a half, something like that. So size of a cat. Um, so they're not going to be, you know, taking down cattle in the fields. They're, these are small animals. They're middle-sized predators, meso predators, uh, and 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 so that's uh, that has an impact, obviously, on, on what they can take out in the in terms of prey. Uh, I've already said the solitary. They avoid open ground. So. Um, I said earlier they, they will move out to about 200 metres from uh, woodland. They're still dependent on that woodland. And so if we talk about the wide open moors, for example, they're unlikely to move into that landscape uh, or, or be found up in that landscape. They're really going to be tied to where woodland is present. Um, and that's especially for shelter, uh, denning, uh, avoidance of being predated and those sorts of things. They're not bird specialists. Um, so to be a bird specialist, uh, you know, if, uh, things like corvids can be bird specialists. So things like jays, uh, magpies that, uh, and, and rooks and things. And they can go, it's, it's quite energy efficient for them to fly around between birds' nests and take out small birds' nests and likes. Um, it's not profitable for an animal like a pine martin to be hunting these on the branch, moving through. It takes a lot of energy and the return is small and, and it's hard to find. Now that doesn't mean they're not opportunists. So if they come across small mammal, uh, uh, small bird um, nests, they will certainly take them and, and other bird nests. So they, they'll take them opportunistically, but they might not, they're, they're not sort of specialists of that. Um, yeah, there's no risk really to, to pets or children. Uh, I guess if uh, your kids, uh, guinea pigs are out on the lawn overnight, then I guess that could be uh, something to consider, but I think that's, that'd be pretty rare. We hear um, uh, sort of anecdotally about um, uh, lamb killing by pine martins. Now, um, there are no formally documented records of uh, lamb killing. But as I said earlier on, uh, pine martins are scavengers and they will scavenge carrion, including lambs and sheep. Uh, and I think where uh, pine martins are associated with uh, lamb carcasses, it's nearly always um, where they've sca they're scavenging the, the carcass. I guess, like most predators or scavengers, if if a lamb is is poorly sickly, then it, they will attend that before it's dead. Um, they can carry uh, bovine tuberculosis. Um, but uh, pine martin ecology really separates them from uh, cattle and badgers and those sorts of things. So, so they're unlikely to be a, a, a key vector in the, the transmission of, of TB in our countryside. Okay, I thought I'd just touch on the squirrel uh, thing, uh, which comes up a lot. I'm just gonna uh, click a few of these on just so we've got them all on. I don't think we need to go through them individually. Um, so, Pine martins are quite often uh, seen to be a, a key way of tackling uh, the grey squirrel issue. Of, uh, this is grey squirrels are non-native species, come from North America. They're introduced in the uh, 19th century, and, and they're now uh, highly abundant and and have big impacts on our woodlands. They they uh, bark strip, um, particularly sort of uh, woodlands that are uh, growing, just reaching where the canopy closes, uh, and that causes huge problems for. For woodland restoration, woodland uh, creation, and the likes. Uh, pine uh, studies in uh, Ireland, Scotland, and more recently Wales have shown that uh, pine martins are associated with uh, lower presence of uh, grey squirrel, and and uh, conversely can have a, a positive relationship with with red squirrel. So where you might find higher numbers of red squirrel, where you're lucky enough to have red, red squirrel, of course. Um, and uh, that's largely probably because obviously North American grey squirrels haven't co-evolved with uh, European pine martins. And, uh, and so if you look at red squirrels, they, when, when they smell pine martins, and these studies have looked into this, they, they become more vigilant, they become a bit agitated and they, they might decrease their feeding or, or, or you know, move on and, 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 or, or feed more vigilantly. Grey squirrels don't have that response. They, they don't show that same response. And so they, um, they tend to, uh, they, they become easier prey. They're larger prey, they're easier to catch. Um, it, it's certainly uh, pine martins, you know, grey squirrels are unlikely to be a very large part of grey squirrel, uh, of a pine martins diet. 
Um, but it's, uh, and so they're unlikely to have that population level effect on gray squirrels by predation alone. But, but another thing that's been studied is the, the fact that they have a, a population level effect through stress. Um, so if, uh, if you know that a lion is behind you, you're hardly likely to tuck into your Sunday lunch with comfort. Uh, and it's the same for, pine, uh, for if, if you know a pine martins in, in the vicinity and you're a, a gray squirrel, it puts stress. So they start to increase their range. They travel further for food and the likes. And that, that puts that, that pressure on the population. They're going to be breeding less efficiently and, and things of that sort. So to summarize then, um, pine martins do have and, and are likely to have an impact for gray squirrels and are likely to be a part of those sort of gray squirrel problems but they're unlikely to be the only solution to that. They're gonna have to be a part of a range of solutions. So why reintroduce pine martins? Well, um, I think the, the first thing to, to say is, is um, they're a native species. They're, they're one of our, our sort of, uh, the, the, the sort of suite of species that we would expect to find in the UK and in the Southwest and in Devon. Um, and they're critically endangered in, in our country. And, and as conservationists, um, we feel passionately that we'd, we'd want to help that species to be restored, to be, uh, become a thriving species again uh, and playing its functions. And that, those functions are critical. So we have lost most of our middle-sized predators, our meso predators in woodland ecosystems. And, and, and it's a role that pine martins fulfill to, to balance out woodland, the woodland environment so I say about, you know, so if, if species are becoming overabundant, they get predated. If, if species are loud and, and, and um, very easy to catch, they'll be taken out. And if you think about that, they'll, they'll open up, that opens up niches for other species to survive. So, so songbirds and likes aren't getting predated by other species, so they might be able to survive in there. And it creates this sort of more diverse um, woodland um, suite of species. They obviously have a part to play in gray squirrel control. And as work goes on about that, um, that they also because they're they're omnivores and they're, uh, frugivores, so they eat fruit uh, and they have very large territories. Then they have a role to play in seed dispersal. And obviously, we're we're you know we're interested in, in woodland restoration, woodland planting at the minute, partly to answer the climate crisis. Uh, but we quite often go along and put all the all the, the you know sticks in the ground, the trees in, but without thinking about the wider uh, ecology and all the, all the different species that are in there, all the ground flora and the and, and the shrubs and the likes. And so, uh, pine martins can play an important role in moving those seeds around and helping to um, create really biodiverse um, woodlands. Um, they, although pine martins will travel uh, large distances. Um, work that's been carried out by ourselves and, and nationally has shown that, that their spread naturally into the southwest peninsula is going to be very slow, even, even when you take account of uh, reintroductions in Wales and the Forest of Dean, uh, certainly not in the next 25 years. Uh, and obviously that makes it a concern for us. We need to see these benefits coming back. We've already, you know, we, we, we're in a nature crisis. We need to start seeing these uh, benefits soon. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, National Pine Martin Recovery Plan for Britain, which has been developed by uh, experts at Vincent Wildlife Trust and our statutory agencies, Natural England and Nature Scott, uh, has highlighted uh, Devon and Somerset as the next priority for reintroductions uh, to ensure a, a viable and, and, and future thriving population of pine martin in, in Britain. I just want to uh, add uh, one last thing on, on why we introduce pine martins. Uh, is obviously we're in a, uh, I say about climate, um, planting woodlands for climate, but we're also in a, a place of uh, nature recovery. We're, we're keen to restore nature, to reverse the decline in nature. And um, when we do that, we often look at quite local sites in terms of what we're going to restore. We say, okay, what, what, what could we be restoring on a single site? If we think slightly wider, we think in a local context, how can I restore networks of woodlands or other habitats? But we rarely stand back to a sort of Devon-wide or Southwest-wide connectivity for a range of species. And pine martins are a species that can travel large distances, uh, regularly 60, 70 kilometres, up to 100 kilometres. Um, and, uh, and so when we're thinking about connectivity at that sort of scale, it really helps us to challenge ourselves to make sure that we're, we're creating those networks of habitats that, that provide that connectivity at a large scale. And that has benefits for other species. We know that bats travel over large distances, for example, uh, and, and birds and the likes as well. So 
Pine Martin can be a, a flagship for that sort of large scale habitat restoration that we're going to carry out as part of nature recovery more widely um, as we go forwards. OK, I'm going to uh, pause there and hand back to Pete. OK, thank, thanks very much, Ed. That was absolutely fascinating. And my apologies, Ed, I didn't introduce you at all um, when uh, I, I handed over to you. Um, Ed is, and he, he did say, is, is Conservation Manager for Devon Wildlife Trust and has been absolutely instrumental in some of our larger um, projects that we have been delivering across the county. Started off as um, our Great Horseshoe Bat Project Manager um, and uh, yet yeah, has, as I said, been leading the, the fore when it, when it comes to uh, a lot of larger scale conservation restoration work and a lot of the thinking behind it. Um, but yeah, my apologies, Ed. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Jenny, Dr. Jenny McPherson um, from Vincent Wildlife Trust. Um, so Devon Wildlife Trust has, has um, worked closely with Vincent Wildlife Trust over many years, and actually they were closely involved and one of the partners in the, the Great Horseshoe Bat Project um, with their um, mammal specialist experience. Um, but, but Jenny's uh, Science and Research Programme Manager for Vincent Wildlife Trust, um, she's worked uh, in research and conservation and pine martins um, and other mammals for, for well over 20 years now. So it's got a wealth of experience, um, including several reintroductions. Um, so Jenny's just going to introduce her experience with pine martins, um, including leading feasibility studies back sort of six, more eight years ago, gosh, um, and um, looking at where translocations were most likely to succeed. So welcome, Jenny, and thank you for your time. Thank you. If I shall um, share my screen, if you just bear with me. Hopefully that's all working. Okay, can you see that? I hope you can. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Yes, I've been working on Pine Martins for more years than I can um, and um, was heavily involved in the, the two most recent reintroductions to, to Wales and Gloucestershire. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about those now. Um, so back in 2000, and, well, earlier than 2014, actually, but um, we started we started looking at why pine martin populations hadn't recovered naturally in England and Wales as they had done in Scotland. Um, and so um, after doing, well, I think BWT were doing um, work on this for about 30 years before I joined them. Um, and the conclusion was that they, they weren't large enough to recover naturally. Um, and although the Scottish population was doing very well and expanding down into the borders, as Ed said, um, there were some there are some quite big, significant landscape barriers, sort of particularly from the from Liverpool and across to the Humber Estuary, that, that big sort of conurbation band of conurbation there, um, that pine martins were very unlikely to get across under their own steam. So really to restore them to southern Britain, Wales and, and further south. Um, translocations that were the only viable option. But since pine martins were common and widespread throughout the country, obviously the landscapes changed considerably. So we needed to um, you know, take that into account and do some, some serious uh, research and, and, and work into um, you know, if and where there were still some areas that were still suitable for um, establishing viable pine martin populations. So we started off with this feasibility assessment in 2014. Um, we used habitat modelling and habitat suitability modelling, looking at all of the other risk factors um, like road traffic mortality and um, sort of conflict with the land users um, and all those other um, factors that you need to take into account, looking at the, the, the biological biological feasibility for um, a translocation following the um, you know, best practice and, and the IUCN guidelines. Um, and as a result of, of all of that, so we looked at the whole of England and Wales, and as a result of that, um, Central Wales was prioritised as, as the most, um, the most um, likely place to support a viable Martin population. Um, so, uh, so we started doing some, sorry, there's the, 
there's the report, which is which is available on the VWT website if anyone is interested in reading that one. Um, as part of the IUCN guidelines, um, biological feasibility is one strand, but you also need to look at the social feasibility and the um, you know acceptability of of, of um, reintroductions, um, particularly when you're talking about um, carnivorous species and predators. So. Um, as well as we were developing the biological assessments, we were also carrying out a lot of work, um, stakeholders and local communities, um, and making sure that there weren't any major stumbling blocks to um, to restoring viable pine mine populations to those uh, priority areas there. Um, Translocations are, are a massive um, uh, undertaking and they should, should never be done um, only as a last resort really, but um, as I said, there was no possibility of, of natural recolonization uh, to southern Britain. So um, there's a lot of, uh, of things that need to be taken into account before you um, proceed. So we carried out field surveys to make sure that there was enough um, prey availability in the potential release sites, um, looked into, uh, um, carried out disease risk analysis, um, and all, all of these other things, and it was a bit, it was a huge um, partnership project. Um, we had many many contributors to. So we got to the point where um, we were able to release animals. So over three years, um, at the the best time of year to release pine martins, which is in the autumn, um, we actually translocated fifty one animals from Scotland, um, approximately equal sex ratios. Um, they were soft released, and they were all radio collared, so that we could monitor their survival and their movements and their behaviour after they were released. Um, and animals welfare and also you know how they interacted with this new landscape so what we found was that they um behaved as predicted so they, they're a woodland species so they avoided open land um they used large blocks of woodland but they also used small copses as stepping stones across across the more open areas um, they particularly liked following um wooded river valleys <clears throat> which was quite lucky because there's, there's an awful lot of rivers in Wales, as, as you know. Um, so that made the landscape very permeable for them, which was which was good. Um, one of our this was one of our most long distance dispersers. So we had one male who was released um, just inland from Aberystwyth here into the woodland around Devil's Bridge. Um, and he headed off north and, and made it about 100 kilometres north before he found a patch of woodland that he thought was suitable and, and settled down and liked that. Um, we also had some animals that moved further south. The majority of them did settle within the within about 20 kilometres of the release site, which was reassuring. Um, as part of all of that research and monitoring, so we had um, a PhD student, Kat McNichol, who was studying uh, grey squirrel behaviour um, and looking at how the um, pine martins interacted with those um, and also um, uh, analysing pine martin diet from uh, the areas where they were taken from in Scotland and then comparing that with how they how they were dining once they arrived in Wales. Um, and then David Bavin, who was one of our um, Phil students, he um, he was also a project officer on the on the project, and um, he was um, heavily involved with all of the um, community engagement and the um, stakeholder engagement, um, and some of the other work more involved with the pine martins themselves. Um, this is a map of uh, some of the radio tracking results, um, as I say, showing that re reassuringly, most of the animals stayed within the release area um, and established their territories not too far from where they were released. Um, but as I said, the large high ranges, um, and so they settled down in these fairly large territories, um, not too far away from each other, and behaved quite quite normally as pine martins do. Um, I say the community um, involvement and and support of uh, reintroduction is is absolutely key, and we were we were very um, the, the communities around the release sites in Wales were very supportive of the project, um, and we had um, we have interpretation panels in several of the woodlands where the martins have set up um, home, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be um, invited to. Um, develop an, a Pine Martin Information Centre at one of the um, tourist railway sites, in uh, railway stations uh, in the area. So this is the Pine Martin Den, so this has a lot of information for visitors to the area um, about the animals and what they do and, uh, and about the project. 
and there are some pine marten walks, waymark trails that people can uh, follow and and uh, stop at various points and uh, and look at um, pine marten dens and look for pine marten signs and and field signs. And uh, longer term monitoring is is key. So it's um, you can't just let the animals out and then hope for the best. Um, we've we've got a very long term uh, commitment to monitoring the, the population in in Wales. Um, in the hope that it established and spreads uh, and the distribution expands over, over the coming years. So the first uh, expansion zone survey that we carried out was with a um, huge volunteer um, effort and uh, that was in 2018, 2019. Um, and this was showed that, so this on the map on the left, you can see the, the um, 10 kilometer squares where the animals were released in the, in the first three years. And then by 2019, they were, there were pine martins recorded in all of these um, 10 kilometer squares that you can see on the right. So they've expanded um, right the way up and down the Cambrian mountains where the, the bulk of the woodland is. Um, and we'd carried out some modeling of the uh, landscape prior to the releases and on the left you can see the map that was our prediction of, of uh, the landscape connectivity, the habitat connectivity and how the martins were most likely to move through the landscape and, and actually they, they map onto each other quite nicely so that was again very reassuring. Um, and as I said it's a massive effort doing a, um, doing a translocation and reintroduction and they're just some of the huge numbers associated with the Welsh project. Um, and then, so following on from that, the Forest of Dean was also identified as a, as a, um, a high priority area. Um, and so in 2019, 2021, um, we were involved in supporting Gloucestershire Wildlife Trust and Forestry England with their project to reintroduce martins to the Forest of Dean. Um, so 35 animals were released and um, they've established territories within the Forest of Dean and, and beyond. Um, and uh, successful breeding has been recorded by at least some of the females in, in each of the years since the releases. So actually that's since 2021, there's been breeding recorded this year as well. Um, I should have said actually in, in Wales, we, we've recorded um, successful breeding by females each year since, since the releases as well. So. Um, the, pine, the pine martins are, are, are doing quite nicely. Um, and this is some modelling that Andrew Stringer did um, uh, prior to the, the Forest of Dean releases, um, looking at the predict, predicting how the Forest of Dean and the Welsh population would ultimately um, spread out and link up. And that will lead to a very um, resilient Western metapopulation of martins um, in that area. And so the hope is that then we can build on that and, um, and uh, have pine martins over a much wider area. Um, and obviously that will make it much more robust into the long term. Thank you. Many thanks, Jenny. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. And um, yeah, having that evidence base behind species reintroduction work is just so critical and you know that length of time as well um that you've you had that um data over um is um yeah it's gold dust um so yeah i'm going to hand back now to ed um i think i think we're a li little um tight on time ed but um we'll we'll another 20 to 25 minutes and ed will um introduce the um objectives of the two moors project um, partnership project. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Pete. Just going to start my presentation again. Okay, so that leads us all into the two, two Moors Pine Martin project, uh, and that's a collaboration between Devon Wildlife Trust, uh, National Trust, Woodland Trust, Dartmoor National Park and Exmoor National Park and Vincent Wildlife Trust have been really key advisors on this project, alongside other support from Forestry England uh, and Somerset Wildlife Trust and, and our statutory agencies in England and, and Scotland. Uh, the goal of the, uh, uh, of the project is to explore the reintroduction of Pine Martins to Devon and the Southwest Peninsula, 
and if it's uh, feasible, appropriate, sustainable, then to carry it out to establish a recovering uh, and in time thriving population of pine martins across the Southwest Peninsula that particularly can link with uh, those Gloucestershire and Welsh populations. And uh, uh, we're really, as a partnership, we're, we're keen to follow, we will be following the international guidelines for translocations uh, and reintroductions. And as a part of that, we'll be carrying out, um, as other projects have, the uh, feasibility studies. We've done this, we asked Vincent Wildlife Trust to do this back in 2020, and this report was produced in 2021, um, to look at the uh, biological feasibility of bringing back pine martins to the southwest. Uh, we, if, if we, anybody who knows the southwest and knows where the, the key woodlands are, uh, will know that you know sort of large areas on eastern Dartmoor and northern Exmoor are, are key areas of large woodland, uh, and so they were always going to be areas that we'd, we'd be looking at. But we wanted to look at the whole southwest peninsula uh, as well. Um, we couldn't carry out the social aspect of feasibility at that stage because that was in the middle of the or just as the COVID crisis uh, was kicking off. So we had to park the social feasibility for a little while, and that's what we're focusing on doing at the minute. Um, I'll come on to that in a moment, but we, we, we progressed with the biological side of things. And in looking at that, a key part of that is the habitat suitability. Uh, and when you look at a map of this, the, the green bits are the most suitable habitat and the blue bits are the, the less suitable habitat. And clearly Scotland and Wales are, uh, and Forest of Dean and the likes have got uh, you know, highly suitable habitat. But the, the West Country as a whole is the next best place in the UK. And, and uh, I think that's uh, particularly important in terms of habitat. And you can see that we've got large areas, uh, as I say, in, in Eastern Dartmoor, Northern Exmoor, and a few other places in the Tor Torridge area and, uh, um, and into Eastern Cornwall as well. But another critical side to this is, is uh, roads and risks to pine martins. And so um, the, while other parts of the UK and England, particularly so places like Thetford or, or the Weald or, or the New Forest might have good habitat suitability, they also have high uh, human activity, levels of activity with particularly uh, busy road networks. Uh, the, the Southwest doesn't have that. And so it enables us to uh, look at this and go, OK, this is really good uh, habitat for reintroducing pine martins. And when we look at things like resistance values, and we obviously have good confidence in, in, in these, um, that, uh, you know, if we put um, pine martins into somewhere like uh, Northern Exmoor or, or into, into Dartmoor, then uh, they wouldn't just be stuck there. Um, they could move. Uh, so the blue, uh, the blue on this map shows, that, you know, be able to, to move through this landscape clearly. Likewise, the blue on this map, um, and, and move into Cornwall, in, back through into East Devon and the likes. And, and actually, you can see on this why potentially pine martins might, might not be able to naturally um, uh, expand, or it take a very long time for them to expand into the, the West Country, because of the barriers, particularly around the habitat um, in uh, Somerset levels and the likes. So, uh, we, we we're always talking about uh, the, the two moors project, two moors, uh, Exmoor and Dartmoor, and, and clearly it would be simpler and potentially cheaper to, to reintroduce to a single area. But as part of the initial phase, uh, that, that feasibility study, we uh, looked at uh, uh, viability analysis of the populations to understand, OK, how resilient are they and, and what would be the results if we if we just release into Exmoor, just release into Dartmoor or, or look at both. And it's quite hard to see, but if you look at the details of these, you can see a dip after both the Exmoor only and Dartmoor only that suggests that they might be vulnerable to those sort of random events that might happen, whether that's disease or habitat loss or something of that sort, um, or weather change, those sorts of things. But also um, uh, the, the hope that they can take advantage of, of other habitats uh, and expand and join up as a single population. And so um, the the, the Exmoor and Dartmoor release suggests that they, they, they're likely to perform better uh, and reach a sort of uh, a, a good level uh, thriving population quicker uh, and more stably. So we are looking at two potential release regions. Um, uh, so one on Northern Exmoor and one on Eastern Dartmoor, no surprises there um, to those who know the, the area. Um, and we'd be probably looking at releasing sort of towards the centre of these. Obviously we want to give the Pine Martins the greatest opportunity to expand out into these zones, but that will depend on the, the, the next year's uh, work. Um, 
We've also been speaking with the statutory agency in Scotland, Nature Scott, to understand if, if we can access uh, pine martins from there. As, you know, obviously we need to be able to uh, translocate animals from somewhere, and we, we've we've got sort of uh, in principle agreement that that, that would be possible so, so long as we adhere to the Scottish Code for Conservation Translocations and the other codes. So that's a big step forward, and that's meant that we can now progress into our development phase, and that's where we are now. We're development phase is lasting from uh, April. Uh, th this year through to December 23. And it's got these three main parts to it. And uh, critical is, is continuing that, that, that social feasibility work, that stakeholder engagement work. So going out there, talking to the people who are likely to be interested, concerned, be affected by um, uh, Pine Martins returning to the Southwest and to Devon. Um, and, and the conversations there, looking at uh, where those concerns are, how can we address those concerns? Can we avoid uh, issues or can we mitigate against them? And, uh, and that then feeds into the consenting. So we can't just go ahead and do this, although pine martins are native and we could potentially just release animals into the, uh, into the wild here without a, a license, but we can't do that without considering their impacts. And their impacts are that we, we already have native species and habitats and the likes in, in our area. So uh, we have to follow the guidance under the habitat regulations assessment to understand what impacts to those will we have. And I'll come on to that in just a moment. Uh, we also have to think about we're moving an animal from one part of the country up in Scotland down to uh, another part of the country. And what, what, what's the risk around disease with that, both for the animals concerned and the native wildlife down here in the lands. Then there are a whole range of other questions, other species, uh, other groups of people that we need to work with to, to answer the, the sort of various questions that are countered in the um, uh, international and national guidance and codes around translocations. And we bring all this together in, in reports that we'd submit to uh, the statutory agencies for those, so Natural England, DEFRA um, and uh, Nature Scott. Uh, and that's the main part of the bulk of the work that we'll be doing in this, this phase. Clearly, we need to fundraise for the next phase. Uh, as well, these uh, translocations are expensive and, and, and we need to make sure that we can do that and be responsible in doing that as well. If we get uh, through all of this phase, then the, the hope is then to progress directly in January 2024 into the delivery phase, which would look at uh, working towards releasing um, the first pine martins, uh, so 20 animals, into either Dartmoor or Exmoor, and then further to, in, in, uh, in the autumn of 2024, and then a second round of, of animals of about 15 to 20 animals in the following uh, autumn um, to the other side, which are, and it will be just the, the, the work of this year will decide uh, if and where that those go ahead. OK, I just wanted to touch on uh, the habitat regulations work, and this really is about the, the risks to our native wildlife that we that we have. That's not just native, but is all, already resident and obviously um, you know, habitats and wildlife uh, face challenges over the last 150 years since pine martins were last here. And we want to make sure that we don't, you know, sort of uh, burden those uh, too greatly um, with uh, the reintroduction of pine martins as species we want to bring back. So, um, and, and critical to that is obviously prey species or potential prey species, albeit opportunistically. Uh, and one of them is bats. You now, I've I, I worked on bat project uh, for a number of years. Um, and, and we, you know, we care passionately, all our partners have worked on bat projects uh, and the likes and, and being ke keen conservationists around bats. And we want to make sure that the impacts on bats um, uh, are, can be avoided or mitigated. And we have species that are particularly important, uh, lesser and greater horseshoe bats. We've also got barbastels uh, on the bottom right here and, and Beckstein bats as well. And we need to make sure that this will work. And there's various options for this sort of uh, work. So clearly we want to try and uh, understand where uh, any risks might be and, and, and then develop bespoke mitigation. And this is work that the Gloucestershire um, project um, has done uh, to mitigate bat roosts uh, against uh, pine martin entry. So things like tip trays and anti-climbing metal sheeting and things of that sort. So they're also novel, they're quite expensive. And so we need to prioritize where those go, but it's something that we'll be carrying out some assessments uh, in the development phase to understand um, where those risks are and what we could do to mitigate them. And, and Vincent Wildlife Trust, the, uh, you know, fantastic experts on, on uh, mammal ecology, both pine martins, but also bats, uh, will be hopefully involved in that. And, and uh, they're obviously key owners of major bat roosts in, in, the, in Devon as well. But also, you know, 
both for, for bats and for other species, we'll be monitoring where the where um, the pine martins are. So at least part, at least about half of them are likely to be radio collared, but also we'll be doing camera trap surveys and things of that sort. And once we are, if we understand, although we can proactively mitigate against some of the impacts, uh, we can also reactively uh, mitigate against other impacts by keeping an eye on where these animals are and and then sort of following this sort of protocol that's been developed on, on other projects to understand where how we might uh, mitigate those or, uh, reactively and check that it's working that sort of thing uh, as well as bats and, and those sorts of mitigation measures which might be applied to uh, to other species as well we have uh, you know birds we, we've got ground nesting birds um, and birds sort of sighted in in different uh, uh, protected sites. Uh, we've got woodland assemblage of, of birds, uh, a whole range of birds that live in woodlands. Uh, and we've got ground nesting birds, like I say, including things like, uh, as well as nightjar at the top there, also uh, curly. We've got the last few breeding curly on Dartmoor. We want to make sure that we can bring back pine martins and not bring uh, an undue risk to these uh, animals. Um, our native wildlife has co-evolved with pine martins and so can, you know, there's largely a balance there. Um, but where we uh, have species that are using things like uh, box schemes, so nest boxes and lights, clearly that presents a, a risk because a pine martin uh, is a curious animal. If it finds something to eat in one box, it's going to check all the other boxes. So we need to carry out mitigation things like these box schemes where, um, uh, uh, the, and we have thousands of these, so 3,000 pied flycatcher boxes. We have uh, and all these green dots on this map are, are, are dormouse box schemes within uh, the two areas. And we, we'll be working with the groups that are uh, managing these and help figuring out how we might uh, go through the process of what is quite simple mitigation, but rolling out to such a large number of, of sites. Critically, we also need to look at socioeconomic interests. So those um, people like the shoot community, um, and uh, poultry farmers, for example, other farmers, um, and, and also foresters and likes. And, you know, this is going to have different benefits and risks to these different sectors. And we're going to be working with the uh, uh, both individual shoots and, and groups, individual farms, um, and, and also uh, sort of agents and uh, the organisations and groups that, that uh, represent these. Uh, communities to make sure we can ensure that the pine martins can be brought back in a sort of sustainable way that doesn't affect people too greatly. So where are we on the project? Well, we, we're just in the, um, the, the sort of the first uh, phase of the development phase, first part of the development phase. We're just in the process of recruiting for a, uh, an officer at the minute, and we've started that initial process of stakeholder engagement. And, and as that develops, uh, we'll be building the, um, with the work to gather evidence around the consenting and the likes as well. And, and we'll also start the fundraising process to, for that de delivery phase as well. So there's a huge amount of work to do. It's very exciting. We're really you know, excited and looking forward to it. Um, and, uh, uh, but yeah, we're just at the beginning of that. There's a lot of work to do. So thank you. That's it. I'm going to um, uh, finish there. If you want to find out more about Pine Martins and the Pine Martin project, the, the Two Moors project, please visit the pages um, on the Devon Wildlife Trust website. But uh, thanks very much.